In this video, I want to talk about the different types of viral genomes. So let's say we have this virus with its lipid envelope, its protein capsid, and its viral genome. We know this virus can bind the cell. And once the virus binds its cell, you know its lipid envelope will fuse with the lipid bilayer membrane of the cell. Now the virus has entered inside the cell. Next, this protein capsid will degrade. It'll degrade and now we've successfully entered the viral genome inside of the cell. However, it doesn't matter what kind of viral genome we have. It doesn't matter what kind. It'll always has this, have the same two major priorities. First of all, it wants to take its viral genome and use it to create viral proteins. Second of all, it wants to take its viral genome and use it to create copies of the viral genome. So once we've created viral proteins and we've created copies of the viral genome, now we have everything we need to create new functioning viruses. So exactly how do we do this? Well, the first step is we take this viral genome and use it to create mRNA. And we know mRNA is essentially just single-stranded positive sense RNA. And we know it's, impo it's important to create this positive sense single-stranded RNA. Because, for example, if we have this double-stranded strain of this nucleic acid, we know it's the positive sense strain. It's this nucleic acid sequence in this positive sense strain. It's these codons with, with this positive sense strain that can create a, a functioning protein. However, if we took the negative sense strand and used the sequence in that negative sense strand and found those respective codons, this would not produce a functioning protein. So therefore, it's important, it's very important to take this viral genome and create this positive sense single-stranded RNA, also known as mRNA, because it's only the nucleic acid sequence in this mRNA that can produce functioning protein. But now that we've created this mRNA, now we can create functioning proteins. Now we can create functioning viral proteins. For example, maybe capsid proteins or structural proteins or maybe other enzymes required for this viral life cycle. So now we've done it. We took the viral genome and we've created viral proteins. But we also learned there's another major priority. We need to take that viral genome and use it to create copies of the viral genome. We need to replicate this viral genome to create lots of copies of the viral genome. But once we've created lots of copies of the viral genome and we've created a lot of viral proteins, now we have everything we need to create new viruses. Now these viruses can bud out and produce these functioning virions. These functioning virions. So now I'm going to go over some specific examples of different types of viral genomes, but it's important to be aware of this. If we're taking a DNA strand and using it to create another DNA strand, that will be catalyzed by DNA-dependent DNA polymerase. However, if we're taking a DNA strand and using it to create an RNA strand, this would be catalyzed by DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And if we're taking an RNA strand to create a DNA strand, we're using an RNA-dependent DNA polymerase. So I know when you first see this, it's a little confusing, but just study this picture and, and hopefully it should make sense. So now let's do some specific examples. Let's say we have this cell and let's say we have a virus bind and then that virus genome enters inside of the cell. And let's say this virus happens to have a double-stranded DNA viral genome. Well, we know once that viral genome enters inside of the cell, it has two major priorities. First of all, it wants to take that viral genome and use it to create viral proteins. Second of all, it wants to take that viral genome and use it and replicate it to create lots of copies of that original viral genome. So if the original viral genome was a double-stranded DNA viral genome, then we want to create lots of double-stranded DNA viral genome copies. But now we've created lots of copies of the viral genome, we've created a lot of viral proteins, now we have everything we need to create new viruses. So exactly how does this process work? Well, again, we learn once we have the viral genome, we need it and we need to convert it into this mRNA, this positive sense single-stranded RNA. And in this video, whenever you see this black box with this shaded yellow, that represents the positive single-stranded RNA strand that's going to be directly translated into proteins. So, so that's what this box means. It's the, it's the mRNA that's going to be used and directly translated to create proteins. But now that we've created this mRNA, now we, now we can, it can be translated to create proteins. But we also know we take the viral genome and use it to create copies of the viral genome. But now we have copies of the viral genome and we have viral proteins. Now we can create new viruses. So let's do another example. Let's say we have another virus bind and then its, its viral genome enters and it happens to have this segmented double-stranded DNA genome. 
So what does the segmented DNA genome mean? Well, most of it is double-stranded. We can see most of it is double-stranded, but there are little segments where it's only single-stranded. We see here it's only single-stranded. But again, once that viral genome enters inside of the cell, it has two major priorities. First of all, it wants to take that viral genome and use it to create viral proteins. Second of all, it wants to take that viral genome and it wants to go through a process to create copies of that viral genome. But once we've created copies of the viral genome and we've created viral proteins, now we can create new viruses. So exactly how does this work? Well, first of all, we need to create a fully double-stranded DNA. Because the enzymes required to, to go through these subsequent steps can only recognize a fully double-stranded DNA sequence. But now that we've created this double-stranded DNA, now we can use it to create this mRNA. We can use it to create this mRNA. And again, remember, this box represents the mRNA, the single-stranded positive sense RNA that's going to be directly used to, and translated into proteins. That's what this box represents. So now we've created this mRNA, now it can be translated to proteins, now we have our proteins. But again, we also take this double-stranded DNA and use it to create single-stranded positive sense RNA. Now that we have the single-stranded positive sense RNA, we can use it as a template to create lots of negative sense DNA. Now that we've created lots of negative sense DNA, we can use it to create certain segments with double-stranded, po adding positive sense uh, DNA. Now we've created these copies of the viral genome. Because again, remember, this was the original viral genome with the segmented double-stranded DNA. Now we've created copies of the viral genome. Now we have copies of the viral genome and we have viral proteins. Now we have everything we need to create viruses. And you might wonder, once we had this double-stranded DNA, weren't both of these single-stranded positive sense RNA? Isn't that what mRNA is? Well, yeah, but again, so really in reality, these actually are the same. But remember, this box just represents the specific mRNA that's going to be used to directly translate into proteins. So that's what's going on with that life cycle. So let's do another example. Let's say we have another virus bind and its viral genome enters, and it happens to be a single-stranded positive sense DNA genome. Well, again, it's the same idea. Once that viral genome enters, it has two priorities, create viral proteins and create copies of the viral genome. Now we have everything we need to create new viruses. So how would this life cycle work? Well, first we would take the double-stranded the, the single positive sense DNA and use it to create double-stranded DNA. Now that we have double-stranded DNA, we can use it to create this mRNA, which again is just single-stranded positive sense RNA. Now that we have this mRNA, we know it can be directly translated into viral proteins. So now we've created lots of viral proteins. But also once we have this double-stranded DNA, we can also use it to create single-stranded positive sense DNA. And now we've created copies of the original viral genome. So now we've created copies of the viral genome and we have viral proteins. Now we can create new viruses. And a very similar life cycle is, let's say, another virus binds, but it happens to have its, its genome as a single-stranded negative sense DNA viral genome. Again, it's the same two priorities, create viral proteins and create copies of the viral genome. And again, it would be the exact same process, create a double-stranded DNA, use this to create mRNA to create viral proteins, and then use this double-stranded DNA to create more copies of the viral genome. Now we have everything we need to create new viruses. So those are DNA genomes, but we also have RNA genomes. For example, let's say a virus binds, its genome enters, and it happens to have a double-stranded RNA viral genome. Again, it has the same two priorities, create viral proteins and create copies of the viral genome. Now we have everything we need to create new viruses. So again, the first step in this life cycle is we take the double-stranded RNA and use it to create this mRNA. And again, remember, this box represents the mRNA that's going to be directly translated into proteins. So we've, we use this viral genome to create this single-stranded positive sense RNA, and also known as mRNA. But we can also use this single-stranded positive sense RNA as, as a template to create more double-stranded RNA. And now we've created copies of the viral genome. Now we have copies of the viral genome, we have viral proteins, now we can create new viruses. So another common type is, is let's say this virus binds, its viral genome enters, and it happens to have a positive sense single-stranded RNA viral genome. So this is the life cycle of a retrovirus. So the way retroviruses work is they use this viral genome and use it to create a negative sense DNA single-stranded uh, nucleic acid sequence. Then we use this to create a double-stranded DNA sequence. So now we have this double-stranded DNA. 
Now, once we have this double-stranded DNA, we can use it to create this mRNA, which again is just a single-stranded positive sense RNA. So now we have this mRNA, and remember, this box represents the mRNA that's specifically going to be translated into viral proteins. So now we have our viral proteins. But we also use this double-stranded DNA sequence to create copies. The, we use it essentially, you can think of it as a template to create copies of this single-stranded positive sense RNA, which again, remember, was the original viral genome. So we've done it. We've created copies of the viral genome. Now we have copies of the viral genome and we have viral proteins. Now we can create new viruses. And again, this is the life cycle of a retrovirus using uh, reverse transcriptase to create this double-stranded DNA so we can go through these processes. And again, you might wonder, aren't these the same thing? They're both single-stranded positive sense RNA? Well, yeah, just remember this box represents the mRNA that's going to specifically be translated into proteins. So another type of viral life cycle, RNA genome, is let's say the virus binds, its genome enters, and it happens to be a negative sense, single-stranded RNA viral genome. Well, again, same two priorities, create viral proteins and create copies of the viral genome. So again, the way we would do this is this single-stranded negative sense RNA would be used to create this mRNA, which again is just single-stranded positive sense RNA. And again, remember this box represents the mRNA that's going to be directly translated into viral proteins. So now we've created viral proteins. But we also use this viral genome to also create this positive sense single-stranded RNA. And this positive sense single-stranded RNA is used as a template to create more single-stranded negative sense RNA. And therefore, it's a template used to create more copies of the original viral genome. Now we have a lot of copies of the viral genome. We have all these viral proteins. Now we have everything we need to create new viruses. And again, I keep saying this, but remember this box, even though these are the same thing, this box just represents the specific mRNA that's going to be used to, to be translated into viral proteins. So now the last type of viral uh, genome is let's say a virus binds, a virus binds, a genome enters, and it happens to have a genome as a positive sense single-stranded RNA viral genome. Well, this is very convenient. This is very straightforward and efficient because it's already in the mRNA form. It's already a single-stranded positive sense RNA. So once this viral genome enters, it can immediately be used as mRNA to be translated into viral protein. So that's very quick. The virus binds, its viral genome enters, and it's already ready to be converted into proteins, be translated into proteins. But we also use this viral genome, this single-stranded positive sense RNA viral genome, and use it to create single-stranded negative sense RNA. Now we can use this as a template to create more single-stranded positive sense RNA. And now, that, so again, we've essentially created copies of this viral genome. So now we have more copies of the viral genome, which again, remember, is single-stranded positive sense RNA. So really, you can think of it as mRNA. So this, these copies of this viral genome can also be used, translated to create, can also be translated to create viral proteins. But again, the point is we've created viral proteins. We've created copies of the viral genome. Now we have everything we need to create new viruses. So this is a life cycle for a single-stranded positive sense RNA viral genome, which is again, pretty straightforward and efficient.